So good morning, everyone from uh, Canada. Uh, my name is Hui Deng, and then I'm glad to coordinate this series on environmental and human health risk assessment of the IIES. Uh, mm -hmm. And then, as you see, uh, today we have, uh, we're glad to have Professor uh, Jan Main from the University of Edinburgh to talk to us about earthquake hazard and associated risk. Uh, so this, um, his lecture uh, fit perfectly in um, uh, our second sections of the series. So we have talked about the risk from uh, water mitigations and um, water security. And then we talk about uh, the chemical uh, risk and how exposure to that may affect human health. And uh, today, uh, Dr. Yan Men is going to talk to us about another element, which is the earth, and then um, how that would affect not only human health, but totally human life and our wealth. So I'm so glad to have Professor uh, Men, and I thank you very much for for your kind acceptance to give this lecture to us. Mm -hmm. So before I turn the stair to uh, Professor Main, I'd love to talk to you a little bit about him. So he's a professor of seismology and rock physics at the University of Edinburgh. And he's as well a director of research of the School of Geosciences of the University of Edinburgh. And on the top of that, he's as well a fellow of the Royal Society of Edinburgh. And just for information, this um, a prestigious fellowship is granted to individual uh, that the Royal Society of Edinburgh mm -hmm. just be eminently distinguished in their subjects. So it's a very prestigious title. Um, uh, and before that, Dr. Main uh, got a, a bachelor from the University of St. Andrews and a master from the University of Durham and a PhD from the University of Edinburgh, all of that uh, from the UK. Um, and he is um, uh, recently uh, was awarded the Louis Neil Medal, M M Middle uh, of the European Geosciences Union. And he is, was very active in um, um, editing and then publishing. So he was a for an associate editor with Natural Hazards and Journal of Geophysical Research. And he was a member of the editorial board of geology as well. So he have published more than uh, 240 articles and who has written six book chapters and all of his work has received more than 8,000 citations. Um, so you may realize a little bit the topic of research of Professor Main, but I just want to summarize it a little bit here. So he worked and focused on the processes that add up to catastrophic failures events from earthquakes, rock fractures, and volcanic eruptions. And he looked at the population dynamics of the uh, brittle fellows as a complex and nonlinear system. So I really look forward to learn more about uh, that. Uh, and so uh, thank you very much again, Professor Main. And I just want to turn this there to you. So I just stop sharing my screen and then... Um, uh, and I'll share mine. Please, thank you very much. Okay. Uh, Oops. Can you see this? Is that showing okay? Yeah, we're seeing okay. Yeah, could you just turn it on into the presenter mode and then uh, we'll, we'll be, uh, we'd see the mode. Better. How do I do that? Present display settings, swap presenter view. Is this it? Yeah, perfect. Yeah, okay. thank you very much. Thanks very much for that slightly over flattering introduction. Um, I don't think all of those publications are refereed in international journals. I think. There's quite a few abstracts in there. So it's a bit less than what you said. Um, so yeah, well, well, welcome everyone. Um, I'm going to be speaking about earthquake hazard and associated risk um, from my office here in uh, the University of Edinburgh, uh, where I work. It's a bit of a cold day outside, but uh, it's nice to be in. <laughs> um, so here's, here's an example of the kind of damage that, that earthquakes can cause. Um, uh, obviously, the, the newspapers and journals tend to go in and look for the most dramatic pictures, and of course it is, um, you know, sort of very newsworthy. But my job is really to try and stop this happening in the first place, you know, that um, it's not really earthquakes that kill people or, or do this. It, it's it's uh, buildings, it's infrastructure, um, and, and that is something that we can change. We cannot really change the, the, the fact that earthquakes occur. Um, so I'm going to start with, a uh, back up a bit and start with a sort of basic definition of what I take to be a natural hazard. Um, but a natural hazard is a, a natural phenomenon that might have a negative effect on people or the environment. So the environment society is inherently tied up with the definition of what a hazard is. 
So it's impossible to talk about hazard without involving, you know, the, our, our, our kind of human society and, and people and individuals as well as um, communities. Um, and a lot of geophysics, I, I, I work primarily on earthquake hazard, but it, um, it also has consequent effects, for example, uh, triggering landslides, uh, for example, in the Nepal earthquake uh, three years ago, or tsunami, for example, in the a 2004 Boxing Day uh, earthquake and tsunami in, in uh, Indonesia near Banda Aceh. This picture here is from uh, the, t the town of Norcia uh, in Italy um, in the aftermath of an earthquake that hit the, this kind of medieval town with, with buildings that are relatively susceptible to, to ground shaking. And you can see the landslide has been triggered. It probably would have happened in due course anyway, but the earthquake shaking just uh, sort of tipped it over the edge. Um, so, uh, where are the earthquakes? Um, uh, here's a map of uh, where the epicenters, that's the location at the ground surface above the, the point of uh, initiation of rupture. And you can see that most earthquakes uh, are on plate boundaries. Here, the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, or here it's you know, sort of Western South America. Um, the ones in the oceans tend to be very shallow and very far away from where we live, so they're not such a big hazard. Um, the ones um, in, uh, on the plate boundaries, like here in Indonesia, you can see they get deeper, <clears throat> so the color goes from red through to green as you go to the north and east, and that indicates the ocean floor here is, is diving underneath or subducting uh, underneath um, the, the, this continental plate here. You can see there's a lot of shallow earthquakes in uh, Nepal, Tibet, and through China, and also right in this belt of continental deformation that goes right through to Greece, Turkey, Italy. Um, and these are often, even if they're not as big sometimes as the ones on the plate boundaries, they can do even more damage because they are shallow and they're near where people live. Um, so hazard depends on a number of factors, including the depth of the earthquake, but um, it, because it is defined in how it affects people, it also depends on the location relative to our cities and so on. Most earthquakes occur in plate boundaries and some uh, within the plate. Uh, they're called intra-plate. And they're mostly on uh, passive margins or failed rift arms. So we have some events that are really quite far from zones of continental deformation, but they are remembering the history. Even in the UK, look here, there's one. <laughs> They're remembering the history of tectonic events and their persistent weaknesses in the crust. Um, and uh, so that map I've just shown you fits very well with our modern interpretation of the uh, sort of deformation of the Earth in terms of intact plates which move around. Here are the velocity vectors for uh, plate movement uh, from GPS stations. You can see there's a lot of GPS stations. <laughs> here in, America, in the US, and some near Trent is Trent about here. <laughs> um, and you can see that these uh, define a kind of rotational deformation, because when you move things around on a sphere, you get rotation. Okay, when you move things on a map, it's just, you know, straight lines, but um, you can see there's this kind of uh, rotation around a pole. Um, uh, is the way we def uh, define motion on a sphere. And these are from satellite observations of the movement of the Earth. Um, so the earthquakes are happening because the plates are converging here. Um, in some places they may be touching apart. Um, and those horizontal forces lead to, uh, from plate tectonics lead to uh, deformation in a number of different modes. Um, uh, earthquakes happen because of slip on faults. So here's an example. Here's a road. Here's someone's house in New Zealand. You can see the whole house has moved on its foundations, but it stayed relatively intact. The roof hasn't fallen in. And then you can see the road used to carry on straight, and now it's over here. So we can estimate the number of uh, amount of s a horizontal def displacement or slip. There's a fault. It goes right through this person's house. Um, and the road is offset by about 10 meters. Okay, that's a lot of slip, a magnitude 7 earthquake, 7.8 in New Zealand. Um, 
and um, you know after the fact it's easy to see the trace of the fault um, obviously from the displacement but um, uh, and this is a horizontal slip a strike this line here is called the strike of the fault it's the direction it's the bearing you would take if you ran along it um, as an orienteer or, or, or if you were walking in that direction and then uh, you can also get uh, faults with hot vertical um, displacement here's um, here's a big scarp uh, which is actually also a fault it's just an eroded fault and here's the, the very most recent event um, uh, near uh, Nice in, in France so th there's a very recent event which has a tide mark here and then above that you see a lot of eroded kind of more pitted surfaces um, so, so that's one event, but this whole cliff face has been formed by many events. So faults tend, earthquakes tend to happen on the same fault repeatedly. Um, and by mapping the faults, uh, we can put that into our understanding of uh, the hazard by having a fault map like this. This is uh, reconstruction for uh, California. Um, and you can see the different kinds of faults. You can see the faults are not simple straight lines. They, they are curves sometimes, complex structures, many branches. Um, um, and so it's really not, you, you hear a lot about the San Andreas Fault, which is this one here, but actually it's only part of the story and it, and it only accounts for about three and a half, you know, three and a half um, centimeters per year of movement. And whereas the motion between Pacific plate and the North American plate is, is more like five and a half. So that's taken up on the, all these subsidiary faults. So the earth is not as simple as just a simple plate boundary. It's actually, especially in continental regions, it's got lots of deformation away from the immediate plate boundary anyway. So the biggest earthquake hazard comes from ground shaking. Okay, so if you're out in the open in a park, far from the ocean or far from a uh, unstable slope, then you're going to be perfectly okay in an earthquake. Um, it's really the effect of ground shaking on the environment around you that, that is uh, the risk, the major source of risk. So if you're in a building which has not been constructed properly to withstand earthquakes, then you could be talking about a lot of damage. Um, you can see here that probably that uh, the building has been made with uh, reinforced concrete so there is some steel uh, within these uh, maybe even you can see see it exposed where they've broken but they've obviously just bent here um, so they've taken some of the strain but not all of it and here you can see some stories have just collapsed in shear and this is a problem because most houses are built to withstand vertical static threats okay but during an earthquake there's horizontal motion there's like pendulum motion, which this, this house has succumbed to, like this. And then there's twisting motions. And most buildings are just not built to, to take that sort of three-dimensional uh, sort of stress. Um, uh, you know, if you look at the beams above your head, uh, you'll find that they're, they're much, much weaker than the walls, for example. So the horizontal stresses are the ones largely which cause this kind of damage. And you can see the shear here in this example uh, in China, I think it is, where, where the, there's been shear like this and the buildings uh, not been able to withstand that. That's a Taiwan earth, but it was in Taiwan. Um, and this is uh, even in, this is in an area, North Ridge in California, where there was a building design code, but obviously, and, and obviously there'd been some uh, reinforcement and, and kind of accounting for ground shaking, but just not enough in this case. Um, possibly because of some local factor that the individuals weren't aware of. Um, and then these are examples of consequent effect. Here's a landslide triggered by an earthquake. Obviously that's a risk if you're driving. Um, this is in Japan, the Kumamoto earthquake. Uh, this picture here shows a phenomenon called liquefaction. So if you take um, uh, a soil which is wet and you shake it very vigorously, then um, you can generate very high pore pressures in the porosity of the, of the, the sediment. So 
what happens then is that the rock, the rock becomes effectively a liquid on uh, the wavelength of the seismic wave. So although you can stand on the earth, it's shaking so hard and the pore pressure inside it is so large that effectively as a bulk, it acts as a kind of liquid. And you can see that these buildings have just sunk into the kind of liquefied mud and soil. Um, so they haven't been shaken and damaged sufficiently. They've just kind of sunk uh, into the ground and tilted as a, as a consequence, come off their foundations. So that's another risk is uh, liquefaction. It's, it's a local effect. You can see these buildings here are okay. So it just depends on the local soil condition. And then of course, the, 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 the biggest consequent risk that's affected people in recent times is the uh, 2011 Tohoku earthquake, which killed about 18,000 people, mostly in the tsunami. Almost no one was killed in the actual earthquake shaking itself, which shows how seriously um, you know, that, that aspect is, is, is taken in Japan. So that was a big success that uh, so few people were affected directly by the earthquake. Um, but obviously the, the main uh, risk turned out to be the, the tsunami, which overtopped the, the sea defences, as you can see here. Um, so we're going to be talking about uh, how, well, so these are the things that are presented to us by the environment. Um, how do we actually sort of defend ourselves against the, the risks that they pose? They're not going to go away, but we can change our behaviour and what we do. <clears throat> and this is the, uh, the notion of hazard estimation, quantitative hazard estimation. So what we do in this is we imagine that all of the past earthquakes and faults and the, the behaviour that we've observed is going to carry on into the future, just like it did in the past. That's a, that's a basic tenet of much of um, geology, um, the principle that the past is the, the key to, to the present and uh, the future. So, um, and by doing that, by adding everything together, then we have a, a hazard which is forecast to not change in time. So we look at the best estimate of the likelihood over many centuries or decades or the lifetime of a building, but it's over a very long time. We don't worry so much about what happens in the short time. Because um, we can have clusters of earthquakes and we worry about them, but separately. For building design, this is what we do. We do the time independent seismic hazard. So first of all, we characterize uh, where, if this is my house, we characterize where the epicenters are, like in the maps that I showed you above, area source. We might know there are some faults like the ones I showed you before, and we know how far away they are from my house. And then when we look at how often earthquakes occur on these uh, epicenters and these faults, we can construct a histogram, a frequency of occurrence versus the magnitude of the event. So magnitude is just the maximum amplitude of the ground vibration corrected back to the source, corrected for attenuation or, or, or the decay in amplitude distance. And what we find is that, that there's not very many big events and there's a lot of small events. And we always find this kind of um, recurrence uh, relation. Recurrence just means we expect earthquakes to happen again, like, like on that fault that I showed you with the vertical displacement. And then we have to say, well, if there's an earthquake here, how much shaking am I going to have in my house? So uh, we have some data on some metric of the ground motion here. It's the peak acceleration. Um, we use, often use acceleration in uh, developing seismic hazard maps because acceleration is proportional to the force on a building. And so design engineers, mechanic, you know, um, who, who, who do uh, kind of architectural engineers can understand that in terms of a force and they can build a building to withstand that force. Um, so that what we find is for big events, they produce ground shaking very far away. For an intermediate event, it comes down like this. And then for a small event, it doesn't go very far. But the decay rate with distance is about the same. Um, and that decay rate is called attenuation. 
So the further away you are from a person, the less likely you are to hear them. And that's just because the energy is moving out over a wider and wider area. Um, and then some of it is also being absorbed by the shaking in the ground. Um, so it's lost forever. And then we put all of these three things together to get a, a net probability of exceedance as a function of ground acceleration at my house, at this one site. And that's a curve. Um, and it really depends, because we don't just want the frequency magnitude relation. That isn't enough to tell us what the, what, what the shaking is going to be. We have to put it through the attenuation relation to get how likely my um, house is to be shook at some, some level. And then we put all that together, and then we, we take this site, and then, sorry, oops, and then we do another one uh, for the site next door, another one for the site next door, and so on. And we make a grid, and then we can contour uh, the level of ground shaking expected over, say, 50 years uh, here in Italy, and then we can contour that um, on, on a seismic hazard map. And here you can see that the biggest seismic hazard is here in southeast Sicily, and then it goes up the Calabrian Arc, uh, the, the mountains here in Calabria, and then up the Apennines. So we can see that the biggest source of risk in Italy is really the topography. These are gravitationally unstable um, mountains, and they are gradually um, extending east, northeast, and southwest, and that's producing the the, the earthquakes that are leading to this hazard. You can see that the 2009 L'Aquila earthquake here, it, it was not a surprise. It happened in an area which had already been identified by the Italian um, agencies as being very high seismic hazard uh, relative to other parts of Italy. Um, okay, so this gives uh, the local authorities, the people with power, um, the information they need to set building design codes. Uh, and that's the intervention that time and independent seismic hazards is. It's really just how strong should we, how strong or how flexible or how, how, how much should we design our buildings to take some damage but still stay up. These are all things that um, design engineers know how to do. It's, it's not a, it's not, um, uh, you know, there's, there's plenty of solutions to that problem without any more research, although more research is always good. <clears throat> and so that is the interface between the uh, earth scientist and the engineer and the decision makers in government, the, the seismic hazard map tool. So I'm going to walk through these elements with you now. So first we've got to uh, um, discuss earthquake sources. So we've got to find out where the earthquakes are. Here the, on the bottom left is um, a map of California with all the earthquakes located. You can see they're kind of associated with the fault map on the right. Um, you can see some areas don't have many earthquakes and they don't have many faults. And there's the odd surprise where there's events but there's no fault map. Because we can only map the faults that break the surface of the earth. So we might be missing some in, in this picture. So we find the earthquakes, we locate them, get their magnitudes, we map the faults. Neotectonic just means the faults have been active in the last 10,000 years. So we can see that, that in the sediments, the recent sediments that have been put down. And we can go to space and look for the strain. We can find out where bits of the earth which are deforming uh, more rapidly than others. But then we might not have all the events. So an earthquake catalog might not have the biggest event in it already. This is a big problem if you're going to do seismic hazard estimation because it means you don't have all the data you really would like. Um, we've only got on the order of 100 years of instrumental data from seismographs. We've got maybe a few thousand years of historical data exceptionally in places like China where they've been recording in writing uh, for, for these natural events for a long time. And then we've got about 10,000 years of the kind of recent geological record. And another factor is that not all of these faults will always produce earthquakes. Some of them just slide very patiently way past each other, very quietly. Uh, they don't produce earthquakes. And then other times the strain it's locked into the fault and it suddenly slips when it exceeds some critical strain. 
and that's what produces the earthquake. It's this kind of sudden uh, rupture. And then we've got our sources, and if they're not look, if the events are not located on faults like they are here in the UK, we have a problem because we don't have many um, surface faults which are active now. But we do have earthquakes. They're not that big. They go up to maybe five and a half on land, and then up to maybe six or so offshore up here in the North Sea. Um, but they're kind of more or less distributed at our, around the place. So what we do in this case, we don't associate them with faults, but we associate them with zones. So we draw kind of zones that are based on the kind of, these are tectonic markers for past geological events. And we make a sort of zoning scheme and then we do the uh, analysis of the frequency magnitude relation from, from those. Um, and here's an example of where we've collected all the, the magnitudes we've collected and then we count them and we plot the histogram of the log. We use the base 10 because Charles Richter defined magnitudes to the base 10. So we use the same um, logarithmic unit on the y-axis here. And then we plot the results and to a very good approximation, that is a straight line. And that, because we're plotting log versus linear magnitude, that means that is a, an exponential relationship. Now this is called the Gutenberg Richter law because they were the first people to dis discover this for magnitudes. And that states that the log to the base 10 of the frequency of occurrence within a magnitude bin or increment is some constant A, which is the intercept on the magnitude equals zero uh, axis on the y-axis when magnitude is zero and then minus b which is the slope of this uh, line times magnitude and typically this slope is one so you can see that you go from three down to one and the same time you go from about four and a half to six and a half on the on the x-axis so that slope is exactly one or this is 45 degree kind of angle here. And that's very common, you know, pretty much anywhere in the world. Um, the, the, so this, this is a, an aspect of earthquake uh, hazard that's relatively predictable. Um, that the, the relative sizes of earthquakes in different places are, are kind of in the same proportion. Um, another thing we need to worry about when we're plotting histograms or taking samples of events, um, is how uncertain our, uh, our measure is. So you can see that here for the biggest events, there's a lot of scatter around the specific curve. And this, these are the 95% confidence intervals which are shown as uh, dashed lines. And you can see that they kind of blow up as you get to the end of the, the line. And that, those are called counting errors. That is when you've got a big sample, here we've got, you know, sort of several thousands of events. We're very sure of that number. But if you've only got um, 10 events, that might be, you know, if you counted that a different decade, that might be 20 events or no events. So, so there's a much bigger scatter uh, at large magnitudes, but only because you've got fewer events. It's just, a, it's just an error of counting. Um, and you can see that the counting errors have the shape of a sort of trumpet. They, they, they kind of expand at the end there. So this is an easy one to remember. And they are formally their 95% confidence. That means 19 out of 20 of these points should be within the line. So you always, you don't worry if the one or two points is outside the line here. Because theoretically this counting error is just 95% counting error. 95% uh, confidence is shown. So this is an example for uh, New Zealand, um, and we still expect one or, you know, one or two to be outside that that range. So this is this is a problem because we don't really want to be sure about the little events. We want to be sure about the big events, but they don't happen very often, so we can't be sure of them. There's there's no way around this. This is just the phenomenology of earthquakes. So you can't always get what you want. And so you must account for these uncertainties um, in, the, in the, the likelihood of events of, of different sizes. 
in your estimate of the hazard because you, you're never going to know it accurately. We don't live that long. Um, we don't have this long record. But what you can do is you can introduce constraints. So in this case, we do know the deformation rate in the earth. Here is the deformation rate. Um, map, and you can see it's, it's highest where all the earthquakes are around the Pacific, where most of the earthquakes are. It's high at the ocean ridges. It's quite high in Greece and Turkey here. And, you know, locally, and then it's much more distributed in, in China, Nepal, mm -hmm. um, and even in East Africa, which is trying to break up uh, and form two continents here. Um, hence the chain of volcanoes that go down the East African route. So it, we, what we can do is we can combine this information with the frequency magnitude uh, relation and, and get a map of the earthquake rate for the big events. So what we can do is we can take this uncertainty here, which is only from the earthquake data, and we can make it smaller by um, introducing the deformation rate as a constraint. Because all those earthquakes cannot add up to more strain than we observe from big tectonics. So that's a hard constraint. Um, and, uh, so here's an example where that has been done uh, for you know, the, the, the hazard rate for large events. Okay, so the ground motion, uh, we measure on a seismogram. Um, and uh, you can see there's an amplitude term, and then there's a time on the x-axis. So these are the kind of wiggles that produce, uh, that we observe when the ground shakes. The ground goes up and down. It also goes from side to side in two different directions. So we generally measure in, in three components, um, up and down, side to side in two directions. Um, and this is actually the same record. It was measured as an, an acceleration and, and it's expressed in, in fractions of the unit of gravity, which is approximately 10 meters per second squared. So th this earthquake did not produce shaking above about 10% of gravity. Um, so the peak acceleration is about um, 0.6. Um, oh, sorry, so th this, is, this is gravity. It's not meters per second squared, sorry. So th this earthquake is big enough to produce a peak ground acceleration of about uh, just under two thirds of, of gravity. So you can see why if we're building our buildings to take a vertical load of 1g, otherwise a building wouldn't stand up, then any shaking in, a, in another direction or even vertically is going to significantly add to the static load presented by the building. Um, so these are large numbers in terms of building design. <clears throat> this is an acceleration record, which in this case that's how it's, it's measured. You have an instrument called a strong motion seismograph and it measures the acceleration directly and then what you can do mathematically is you can integrate that record with respect to time using calculus and recover the velocity of the ground motion the speed that the ground has gone up and down by and then you can integrate that again and you can get the displacement field that is the absolute amplitude of where it is in time and each time you can see that the frequency is getting lower okay so the, the acceleration is always much higher frequency, much faster oscillations than the displacement record. And each of these affects buildings in different ways. So building design engineers put these into kind of little scale models and they shake, they shake their little scale model on a table, to see how they stand up to these records. And you can put these records straight in to uh, to see how the, the scale model building does and see if your design is sound. And then some aspects of source uh, ground motion are due to being very close to the source. And this applies to very big events. Look, here's the source uh, amount of slip for the Sumatra 2004 event. So these are kilometers along the strike of the fault. And this is the depth in kilometers. And this is the amount of slip in the colors. You can see it goes up to um, on the order of 20 meters, in fact. 
So these are kind of centimeter. Uh, sorry, the, the the absolute slip is up to twenty meters in in the colors, and then the earthquake started down here, with it where the star is, and then the rupture front spread out as these kind of concentric uh, contours. 10 seconds later, 20 seconds, 30 seconds, 40, 50 seconds later. You can see it's a bit of a jagged front. And then it reached a, a place of high resistance and, and a huge amount of slip occurred here. And then it punched through and carried on. And there's another kind of high slip area here. And then in fact, it carried on for another four or 500 uh, kilometers, uh, not shown on this graph. So this means that the, um, the amount of ground shaking is going to vary quite a lot near, near the source. As you, as you put your seismometers along here, you'll get very different readings because you've got different amounts of slip happening very close to you. Um, and so we do worry about the sources as well as the, the, kind of, um, the, the effect of the wave propagation um, in terms of establishing the ground motion. And then <clears throat> this is how the ground motion decays with distance. This is called the attenuation. So that's the amplitude reducing as, as you get further away. Um, here's the acceleration in gravity units again. It's rarely above one. Um, it's not impossible, but it's very rarely above one uh, as a function of the distance uh, on a log scale here as well in, in kilometers. And you can see it has this kind of curved shape when you put it onto logarithmic units. Um, but there's a big scatter. So there's a big variation, as I showed you for the liquefaction example, you can have two buildings that are very close and they have totally different responses to an earthquake. And that's just because of maybe the building itself or the ground motion. But in this case, it's just the ground motion, which is varying very much on a small distance uh, because of the differences in the site. So we must quantify, this is another source of uncertainty that we must quantify. And the scatter is because of geology is complicated. So you've got lots of um, scattering in the wave field itself, focusing effects, um, sort of, uh, resonance effects in the soil column that can lead to liquefaction and so on. Um, and you can see that the attenuation varies from place to place in this map of uh, these are the locations where people reported feeling an earthquake to the USGS um, website. There's two events of round about the same size. This one was in central Virginia. This was in central California. And you can see that in the west coast, the number of people feeling the earthquake and reporting it on their computer, it produces quite a small area, whereas in the east coast, it's massive, right up to Canada. So um, what this means is that the rate of decay in this curve is much quicker for California than it is for Eastern United States. So we have to, it's not all about where the earthquakes are and how big they are. It's also about how the earth transmits that energy and how much is absorbed. Um, so although California has a high hazard, it, it's very good at absorbing that energy in, in all this complex kind of fault uh, system. So it's got a way of muffling the amplitude. Um, so, and then the final thing is site effect. Um, this is a Loma Prieta earthquake. And um, in this uh, Susan Hawke's um, paper in Nature, she showed significant amplification of the ground shaking and poorly consolidated low shear wave velocity sediments. So that means, oh, if you look at these curves here, the dark, the darker line is smaller than the, the lighter line, which has these two great big peaks. So they, they uh, are resonant. So, so the, the, the solid rock underneath the sediments is shaking by a smaller amount than the sediments. So the sediments have gone into resonance. And you can see the harmonics here. You can see this, frequ this frequency is roughly double that frequency. In the same way as if you took a, a note from a violin, you would, you would see these harmonics, these kind of natural frequencies that are excited uh, by, by deformation, high frequency deformation. 
Okay, so that, that is a risk which is really controlled by where your building is in some ways more than the actual shaping itself. So this is something, but this is in a way something that you can predict in advance. You can go to your building site and you can do a test to find out these resonances without waiting for an earthquake. Um, so that's, that's a, one way of protecting yourself is to go find out how susceptible the, the ground is naturally to ground shaking. And then we put all this together. So we combine the expected ground motion from all the sources. Uh, we make a composite plot of the probability of occurrence uh, for a given level of ground shaking. We have to pick uh, the ground shaking uh, measure that we, um, we think is important. And largely that's down to the design engineer. Um, is it going to be displacement, velocity, acceleration? Is it going to be the peak value? Is it going to be some average of the wave train? Um, is it going to be the duration of the event? The longer events go on the in cyclic load, uh, the more susceptible a building will be to failure. Um, and then, as I've said, I've kind of emphasized really, how do we account for uncertainties? That's really important. And then finally, and this is not a decision for scientists to make, you have a curve here, probability exceedance of some level of ground acceleration, which does not go to zero, right? It never goes to zero. So you cannot afford to make everything safe 100%, okay? Because uh, you have some limit. And you so you have to pick a metric, a probability of exceedance that you're going to live with as a risk compared to other risks like uh, you know, being killed or injured in a car crash or some cost, you know, like um, it's gonna cost this amount and do we do that or do we spend more money on a CT scanner for the hospital? So, so this decision is always an economic one. It's not one that scientists should really make. The scientist's job is to, to, to produce the curve, to produce the map, but really it's down to the elected, you know, the, or, or the, the, the kind of a, the governmental authority or someone delegated from that to make these decisions. People in charge. And so some decision is made as to what is an acceptable risk. And that decision in this case has gone here, it's just a theoretical example, but that green horizontal green line is what was considered, that's the thing we're gonna map, and then and inform our building design codes. And this acceleration here is the result. So this is what is plot. We don't actually plot the probability, uh, we, pro we plot the probability of exceedance at, at some level of ground shaking, um, at different levels of ground shaking. For a given probability, and that's usually it may be on the order of you know, a ten percent chance in fifty years might be one choice, but that's a choice made by um, the the actual operational uh, needs in terms of the average lifetime of a building or some other factor, which is not to do with the earthquake process. So this is a big question. This last question here: How do we decide on an appropriate acceptable hazard? And by we, I mean society. I don't. I don't mean. Um, uh, the scientists, because really that should be done independently from the scientific input. Um, and then this is the result. Here's two examples. Here's one for California on the left. You can see it's very much informed by the, the fault map, as well as the location of the, the events. And here's one for the whole of the US. And you can see that the contours are much closer together in the west and the east because of this difference in attenuation. And what's plotted here is your chosen hazard threshold. So you pick your, your horizontal green line and you map the acceleration you expect at that level of probability. So these contours are all um, in, in level of ground shaking expected. So here is just what I said actually, it's a peak acceleration in the horizontal direction with a 10% probability of being exceeded in the next 50 years as a function of position. So this is Alaska here, there was an event down here uh, last week near Anchorage, this is Hawaii. Um, and then you can see that this, this has been smoothed quite a lot 
fairly smooth. Any contouring algorithm smooths uh, the, the data to some extent. And again, you can notice a different hazard in the eastern, uh, the western United States. Some due to more earthquakes and some due to a slower attenuation. And then, so we're now going to, now that we've sort of defined how we do a hazard map, we need to think of what else is important. And the first thing that's important uh, for earthquakes is really the vulnerability of the structures. And if you look up the dictionary, the vulnerability is the inability of a system or a unit. So it doesn't, it's not just one building, it, it could be an infrastructure like a road or a, a network of roads or it could even in the modern day be a network, a computer network or a power network. So it can be systems as well as um, uh, individual buildings uh, to withstand the effects of a hostile environment. Because that's what vulnerability means. It's, it's not how, how big the event is, it's how, you know, how resistant that, that system or unit is to, to, to the threat. So the vulnerability is really the probability of an undesirable outcome. For example, damage to buildings, loss of life um, as a function of excitation. In this case, um, it's normally the peak ground acceleration uh, during an earthquake that we're concerned with. So these are curves of the amount of damage um, that a building is sustaining as a function of peak ground acceleration for three different buildings or building types. I think this is, this is an amalgamation of data from different uh, buildings. Um, and, it, and it really, there is no pattern in these data. That's very obvious. So it really varies a lot from building to building. Generally, there's more damage when the ground shaking is, is higher. There's no doubt about that. But there's a massive variation in the amount of damage at the same level of ground shaking. So the peak ground shaking isn't capturing everything about the, um, the susceptibility to the, 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 um, you know, the forcing that the building is having to withstand. It's, it's only one metric. So we really need, in general, to be looking at more than one. And uh, the best fitting curves here have a completely different form for different types of buildings. Um, so he, here you can see one where um, there's a really a very big amount of damage in that example for, you know, a place where other buildings have almost no damage. You know, so the, the, again, we're dealing with big uncertainties. We cannot be sure um, about any particular outcome. We can only uh, do an average. So the building vulnerability to ground shaking is extremely variable from place to place, it's even in areas which have got building design code. It doesn't mean it's completely, um, you know, the likelihood is the same everywhere. It's, it varies a lot. There's a big scatter about the best fitting curve that you've got to account for when you're planning um, for the future. The other thing that we have to worry about, so that's uh, vulnerability. The other thing we have to worry about is exposure. And by exposure, I mean exposure to risk, to, to uh, you know, loss in some way, loss of econo economic loss, but loss of buildings, loss of infrastructure like you know, hospitals, roads, power lines, uh, water, and so on, clean water, and so on. And this is getting worse. So our exposure as a kind of human population is to earthquakes is is getting worse with time, and that is because many more of us are living in large cities near in areas at risk. So you can see that the, there's a lot of large cities. New York is, is quite far from a plate boundary, but a lot of big cities um, in areas at risk. And uh, so this is changing, and that's not going to be very different in the next 20 years, uh, 30 years, you know, the lifetime of the buildings we were um, building now. But it's really important at a time when the, the earth, you know, population is urbanizing to kind of seize the opportunity to make sure the buildings that are new from now on um, are, are, are built to, to withstand this, uh, this hazard uh, because our exposure is going up. 
So it's, it's both a threat and an opportunity. Um, it's a threat because a lot of people are, a lot more people are going to be at risk living in, uh, you know, masonry structures that might be susceptible to ground shaking. But on the other hand, now we've got a chance to make sure the new buildings are built to, to take that, that uh, amount of shaking without, without falling down. Um, and this is a kind of uh, calculation that you need to make. You, you, decision makers don't make decisions about where people live or, you know, planning permission or um, how, how, how shaking resistant you need to make a building based on the hazard. They do it based on the risk. So the risk is the product of the hazard, the vulnerability, and the potential loss, the exposure. So the risk exposure is the potential economic, social, and environmental consequences of a hazardous event that may occur in a specific, or events, sorry, that may occur in a specific period of time. So it's expressed as a probability of loss, including loss of life, damage to buildings, infrastructure, livelihoods, financial losses, and the economic losses are often expressed after an earthquake in terms of the percentage of the gross domestic product. So what um, the, U the United States Geological Survey does is immediately there's an earthquake, they put out an estimate of the number of fatalities, a probability. Remember I said every everything was very uncertain and the same is true of forecasting the losses just from the, you know, where the earthquake happened and so on. So you can see that this is on a logarithmic scale. So there's a, a, a large uncertainty in the outcome. This is the number of fatalities uh, for this event in Kathmandu. These are the, these different contours are the levels of ground shaking expressed as a kind of a categorical scale of intensity in Roman numerals here, four, five, six, seven. Um, so that's the amount of ground shaking as observed by people, not as recorded by instruments. And given this map here, you can then predict or forecast, because it's uncertain, um, the likely number of casualties and the likely economic losses in absolute units. Sometimes that's translated into percentages of gross domestic product. And this information is very useful um, for um, aid agencies and you know, the, the authorities who are going in after an earth to work out where they should spend resources on the relief effort uh, to reduce the scale of the disaster. Um, so um, and that brings us into the question of how, how do, now that we've got a risk calculation, how then do we make a decision? Okay, so this comes into the kind of area of uh, comparative risk because there's always not enough money to do everything. So you've got a certain amount, a certain amount uh, of uh, funding in your economy to do different things, and only one of them is earthquake-resistant design. So how does it? Essentially, you have to compare the earthquake risk and the consequent events with the risk of uh, of other things that um, decision makers have to to worry about daily. The earthquake is going to maybe only affect you every several decades or hundreds of years, but um, you know there are all these things that happen every day that uh, decision makers worried about. And these are the risks from actuarial statistics well a couple of decades ago now but I'm sure it hasn't changed a huge amount since then. So there's a risk of mortality. So the, the biggest risk worldwide is uh, in, in insurance terms anyway is smoking 10 cigarettes or more a day. So you have an annual chance of death of 1 in 200. So everybody watching if if we all want to reduce, save lives in a way, that's the most important thing we can do is to point the statistic out, you know, to our friends and <laughs> so on. All natural causes by age 40 is one in 850. Uh, you know, any kind of violence or poisoning is very rare, but of course that's what makes the newspapers. So we think it's more common than it is. Um, influenza accident on the road in Europe, one in 8,000. And then here's an earthquake living in Iran. It's about one in 23,000. Here's the damage after the BAM earthquake in 2003. It's almost total. It's kind of a direct hit on this uh, 
on this town, which was near a fault. So very unlucky. But the same thing, uh, earthquake living in California is only one in two million in the last hundred years or so of data. So that shows is that if you design your buildings to withstand the damage, then you can have orders of magnitude improvement in the loss. It's not just a little bit, it's, it's several orders of magnitude. Um, and you do that by various engineering interventions. So here you can see these base isolators in the bottom of the, uh, the columns, the steel columns, and you can see these cross beams that absorb the twisting damage. So it's not that engineers don't know how to do this. It's really just that um, this, this requires some extra expense. Um, in California, it's, it's not a huge amount. It's, you know, maybe a few percent or even less. It's much more expensive to do this in retrospect. So if you go to a city which has already got vulnerable buildings and you try and retrospectively adjust them by putting in cross beams or whatever, that's much more expensive, retrofitting. Um, so there's a kind of balance to be made as to you know, where you spend resources on, on retrofitting. Um, if, if, depending on the scale of the economy. Uh, but this is the way we need to present our information, really, if we want to have a, a kind of effect as a side on improving things out in the field. The hazard is a necessary step, but really it's only when you got to the point of quantifying the risk that we, we can um, kind of allow decision makers to make relative uh, choices between uh, different alternatives and which risks are more important uh, in different parts of the world. And if you want to hit, read uh, a bit more about this, there's a very good book by Leon Reiter, published a while ago, 1990, on probabilistic seismic hazard analysis. And then more recently, um, there was a review of operational earthquake forecasting, which also includes what you do when you have um, swarms and clusters of events and the hazard rate is actually changing on a short time scale. Um, this is nothing to do with what you do with buildings, but it's to do with maybe people being aware of the risks compared to some of the other risks that they're um, exposed to as part of the normal life, let's say. But that's all I have, so I'll hand back to the chair. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much, Professor Main, for this very interesting talk, and then we learned a lot about earthquakes. Um, so we may have a couple of minutes sometime for questions. Oh, sorry. <laughs> yeah, if you, uh, if some of our uh, students or uh, attendants may have um, to ask um, Professor Min, I may start with my first questions. Yeah. So, um, mm -hmm. and um, we, we, we know a little bit where um, there's more risk of earthquakes to happen. Mm -hmm. And um, what would be the uh, international effort to try to control that and to help countries like Indonesia a couple of months mm -hmm. ago, they got uh, hit by these earthquakes yes. and the liquid fractions of the soil. So how, mm -hmm. what is international effort and community to be able to monitor and help and predict that and then to, uh, Mm. Uh, control and prevent that? Well, <laughs> you're not going to be able to control nature. Mm -hmm. The only thing we can control is where we put buildings and infrastructure and how we design them. And then uh, how we police whether those designs have been kind of um, actually carried out by, by the, the, the builders and the architects and so on. So, we can't change the risk. At present, um, there's no immediate prospect of predicting individual events. So all of the, um, the material I showed today is based on estimating the likelihood of a population. So you don't, you don't say this earthquake is going to happen tomorrow at five o'clock in this location because we're nowhere near being able to do that. Um, certainly not with any kind of confidence that would allow, say, an evacuation or, or something like that. And it may be that earthquakes are so complex, we'll never be able to do that. That's another thing. See, see. Um, so the, the, the present day models for earthquakes that produce this Gutenberg-Richter distribution have you know, an inherently chaotic nature. In other words, you, know, they, you might be able to predict times when it's forecast when it's more likely, but nothing like you know, a deterministic forecast. 
most of the kind of suggested precursors in, in this Jordan and others uh, mm -hmm. review, um, we concluded that uh, most of the precursors, we, or we agreed with the International Association of Seismology, Physics of the Earth and Theory, who did a big review on this in, in the 90s and 2000s, that there's no compelling evidence for precursors to earthquakes. Um, and, and, and so the prospects for earthquake prediction of individual events is really very low at the moment, and it might not be possible ever. But in the absence of that, we can still, if we want to prevent disasters, or, or at least we may never be able to prevent them. As I've said, there's always surprises. There's always a big scatter in the data. But if we want to minimize or mitigate that uh, damage, build resilience to earthquakes, then that is what we can do as a human society. And it has to be done by society. It cannot just be done by, by scientists uh, pushing out information. It has to be that you work with people on the ground. So more and more, we're finding, um, certainly within our group in Edinburgh, we're working much more on the ground with people uh, than, than we used to. You know, we're involving local stakeholders in things like a tsunami evacuation plan. Mm -hmm. We're giving the information, but obviously they're de designing the systems, they're de designing how you communicate that information to different kinds of groups in a way that, um, you know, we can check that that's a reasonable thing, but we, we're not going to sort of really do that for the group because it depends so much on, 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 as I've shown, the risk calculation depends on so much on what other risks there are um, in that local area, you know. Yeah. So I would say that, that if you want to improve things, then, you know, as a scientist, talk to people, talk to engineers, talk to decision makers, um, you know, work with them. Uh, more understand the problems, but keep away from the decisions. Scientists should not be making these decisions because because you don't have the information on what what is, you know, like uh, the best way to spend a, a finite kind of resource. You know, when there's competing demands mm -hmm. uh, for, for that. You know, that are much more pressing to people's everyday needs. Um, so, so that kind of dialogue, engagement, co-production of knowledge, uh, very much we work with uh, local people and we involve social scientists now, you know, like how do, how do societies respond to threats and so on, and especially about communication issues. Um, and we essentially support decision makers. We don't, we don't get involved in making the decisions. The Lombok earthquake was uh, obviously um, not unexpected. The, uh, the, you know, obviously the, the plate tectonics of the areas were well understood. It wasn't a surprising event. Um, it it uh, there was some some additional damage caused by the tsunami because of the kind of coastline, the shape of the coastline, which again could have been foreseen in 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 prospect if if models were run. I'm sure I'm sure they were actually. Um, but in the end, it comes down to local decisions about where we live mm -hmm. and uh, the, the kind of the, uh, the amount of strengthening and, and, and sort of resilience that we build into buildings and our infrastructure that, um, that we can control. We can control that. Mm -hmm. um, but it's always a decision based on, you know, weighing up uh, other factors. Awesome. Thank you very much for the, your elaborations. I just wonder if there's any other questions from the uh, audience? Uh, if not, I have a second one, please. <laughs> um, yeah. And um, as you said, that earthquake is not the direct um, uh, thing that induce um, human loss and wealth loss, building damage, but more like a um, um, consequence of that, like to tsunami yeah. and liquefaction. Mm -hmm. So how could we predict the risk of liquefaction, for example? Uh, um, pe people are doing this. They're going around uh, measuring these uh, soil resonance mm -hmm. profiles, for example. And that gives you a definite clue as to as to where the ground shaking is going to be greater, and that's very that's particularly useful before you build. So you go you go into you know an alluvial plain which is nice and flat where the the, the developers want to put the buildings or the town council wants to put the building, and you just look at its susceptibility to shaking and you try and identify like parts that are at high risk. Maybe you make them a park, you know. So maybe there's, there's solutions which are not high cost. 
because identifying, you, and as I say, you don't have to wait for an earthquake to, to get the soil response, or at least the linear part of the soil response. Liquefaction is non-linear in the sense that once you go over a tipping point, it's completely liquid. <laughs> yeah. That's, that's actually a bit more hard to map, but you can map the, you know, the, the kind of, in the small amplitude range, you can map the soil response and identify the harmonics. Um, which often are, are what cause the damage. Um, it's kind of very amplified um, kind of resonances in the soil column. Um, you know, that can turn 0.2G into 0.6G, you know, so suddenly you're, you're, you're a very high level of shaking. But that can be done ahead of time. You don't have to wait for the earthquakes. And, and you can do it before you start uh, building the foundations. You know. Yeah, of course. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Thank you very much. Uh, any last questions? If not, I mean, if you have any question later on, you can just transfer to me and I may transfer to Professor Main uh, later on. So I just want to thank you again for this very interesting lecture and then um, thank you to all the participants to the series and um, hope to see you more uh, in the next uh, activity of the IIS. Okay, and uh, good, good luck with the program going forward. Um, I'm, I'm still optimistic, I think, especially if there's lots of uh, earlier career people listening to this. You know, you, we can all make a difference by, by putting the information out there. And there's really a big opportunity with the amount of urbanization in the world. It's a threat, but it's also an opportunity, mm -hmm. you know, to influence, um, you know, societies to address this problem in a, you know, sort of optimally economic way, you know, uh, and reduce some of these losses. We don't want to see this go on. Awesome. Thank okay. you very much.